and welcome to another Artist Talk and Art event on Monday, April 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Doug Shear, president of ATOA. Tonight, artist Elisa Pritzker and joins Babs Rheingold for a conversation about Rheingold's work on beauty, poverty, and the environment. Artist and writer Eddie Yeniv in her magazine Archfield states, quote, in her multi-layered installations, Babs Ringgold brings together drawing, sculpture, found objects, and at times video to create potent environments alluding to the body, the environment, and the passage of time. Ringgold's installations inhabit space as an alternative force of nature and take a life of their own. This program is copyrighted by A2A with all rights reserved and is being recorded. It will soon be deployed to A2A's YouTube channel. Don't forget to join us next Monday at 7 p.m. for an A2A legacy panel replay of the figure, Another Side of Modernism with Lily Y moderating and panelists who include Inka Eisenhigh, Al Leslie, Joan Semmel, and Alfredo Archia. In order to keep serving you with free art talks, we have for the, as we have for the past 48 years, we request that you make a donation by going to our website at atoanyc.org and just simply find the contribution page. Elisa Pritzker is an Argentine-born American artist, independent curator, and art columnist. As an artist, she is working in two and three-dimensional art along with installations. She has exhibited at MoMA, Queens Museum, Skirball Museum, Jerusalem, Dorsky Museum, Esper Esperanceda Barcelona, mm -hmm. K Salon, Berlin, Germany, Rockefeller Center, and in small and large group exhibits. Among solo exhibits, her art was shown at the Hudson Valley MOCA, formerly the HVCCA, Hammond Museum, Salada Kinchica Art Gallery in Pisa, Italy, Casa Argentina, Jerusalem in, in Israel, Galleria Artex Arte, Luz and Alfonso Castillo Foundation, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Pritzker is featured at, at PBS channel, CNN in Spanish, Huff Post, Google Arts and Culture, Chronogram, Chronogram Magazine, Hyper Allergic and her Eclectica store was showcased in the New York Times. To learn more about her art, visit her website at elisapritzker.com and on Instagram, Wikipedia, and YouTube. Venezuela-born American artist Babs Rheingold creates sculptures, drawings, and installations focusing on the environment and poverty. Rheingold has an extensive showing history, including 15 solo exhibitions and over 75 group exhibitions ranging from museums, universities, alternative spaces, and galleries. Solo exhibits uh, include New York City, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Savannah, St. Petersburg, Florida, Jersey City Museum, and Buffalo, New York. Museum exhibits include the, New the Newark Museum in New Jersey, uh, the Jersey City Museum, the Albright Knox in Buffalo, New York, Birchfield Penny in Buffalo, Tampa Museum and Museum of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg. She has worked in museums and private collections throughout the United States. Awards include a Florida State Fellowship, two grants from Pinellas County, guest editor for issue of Arts Journal New Observations, Atlantic Center for the Arts Residency and a nominee for the Joan Mitchell Fellowship. 
An upcoming solo exhibition, Felled Tree, is scheduled at HCC Gallery 221 in Tampa, Florida from October through December, 2022. Reingold has an MFA from SUNY Buffalo and a BFA from the Cleveland Institute of Art. She lives and works in St. Petersburg, Florida with a viewing space in New York City. Alyssa. Yes, uh, well, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be uh, having a conversation with Babs that uh, this is a, a conversation online, but we had many conversations. So we know each other, Babs, if you can remember where we met, we were trying to figure it out uh, how many years and wh where we met. Do you remember? Uh, yeah, I have a fair recollection. Um, I'm pretty sure it was in 2010 and we met on uh, Facebook, on social media first. And of course, at that time uh, I was full-time in New York and as Elisa is still full-time in New York, mm -hmm. but we were on both, um, we were both on Jerry Saltz's uh, Facebook feed, as well as um, Todd Levin's feed. And so we were constantly uh, following their conversations. And uh, there were some fascinating conversations. And what happened with those Facebook feeds was that we branched out and met a whole new group of people and they became kind of our people. And so Elisa and I started going to shows together. We would meet regularly in the city. And um, and that's how I think it all transpired. And then she did this fabulous project that involved um, <laughs> organizing something for Jerry Saltz in 2011. And I was a part of that. And, uh, and that's pretty much the history. And we've stayed in touch. And so what is that now, 12 years later? Yes. So it's a while. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, uh, we, I have a, my background has younger Babs and younger Elisa <laughs> together. Uh, we, in one of uh, Babs' amazing installations. So welcome Babs. And I know that you have a wonderful amount of work to share with this audience. So, you know, if you want to share your screen and definitely, you know, after you talk a little bit about your work, I have a few questions uh, that I'm sure that uh, the audience, the audience will be happy to hear and also uh, will open up the, the opportunity for people to ask you questions. Okay, do okay. you want to hear your screen? Yes. Okay, here we go. Does it look fine? Yes, yes. Definitely. Okay, okay. So um, as I go through the presentation, you'll see that I like to experiment with a lot of unique materials and ordinary materials as well. And I make sculptures, drawings, and paintings and installations. Um, the first and main theme I'm going to address is the environment, but keep in mind that they frequently over all the themes frequently overlap, which is the environment, poverty, and beauty. Um, but mainly the focus at this point is the environment and poverty. And uh, I um, I also uh, like to make drawings of my work uh, before I install them, and of course, like artists that do large installations, it's pretty impossible most of the time to see them in your studio. So you have to visualize them in your head. And um, this was the first study that I did um, in 2008. But uh, two events changed the course of my art. One affected hundreds of thousands of people and the other affected me personally. Uh, poverty came to the fore in 2005 when I watched Hurricane Katrina uh, uh, you know, devastate New Orleans and impact its less fortunate population. Um, and actually, I was pretty horrified by that whole scene. And it, 
it was personal for me too because I uh, it, it it brought back my own memories of poverty. Um, and then in 2006, I heard Jared Diamond, the anthropologist, speak about uh, uh, Easter Island. He was talking about uh, in his from his book. He was talking about collapse, why societies choose to fail or succeed, and. Uh, he asked this question in Easter Island, like, what was the Islander thinking when he chopped down the last tree? Um, but as I said, it, that was in 2006, and it took me till about 2008 to do the first study to conceive the last tree, though I had started other environmental works. Um, and you can see here that I'm working on one of the pails. Uh, the pieces are made of uh, silk organza and uh, they're stained. It's a stain that I have developed. Um, but uh, this uh, and the first slide that you saw was the installation at the um, um, the Birchfield Penny, uh, and I'll show that again. And um, anyway, there's 193 fabricated stumps, and uh, they they represent the number of countries in the UN. And, um, and as I mentioned, there was this inspiration by Jared Diamond, and that's the title, of course, comes from that. And you can see here that the, the pails are, they're filled with hair, the stumps are stuffed with hair, and all the pieces are stitched individually. Um, the main, the main trunks were uh, uh, machine stitch, but then there's a lot of hand stitching that goes on to, to create these. Um, anyway, so uh, I then um, went on to, uh, um, oh, I should explain to what's happening in this installation. Uh, there's a video portion that plays along uh, with Jared Diamond cuts in at some point, but it has this eerie soundtrack that uh, was developed by uh, artist and friend uh, Lynn Culbertson. And there is, there, it comes, it starts in with this rhythmic chopping and all you're hearing is this chop, chop, chop. And then her creepy music comes into play. And then Jared Diamond makes his remark. And then it's, it's about a seven minute video that then plays on a loop and a chainsaw comes down. And I saw these, these pails that were filled with hair, I like to think of hair as a collective humanity. Um, and that's the reason I've used it. And now in this next body of work, which is earlier work, and I had said, I'm gonna bounce around a bit, but this is what I like to call my poverty and concealment work. And um, I, 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 um, I didn't realize that the concealment work was really a precursor to the poverty series. Um, uh, it was initially focused on illuminating an individual hiding within his or herself and hiding secrets and layers within layers was something I was familiar with in regards to my own experience looking back. Um, and it seemed to include, uh, you know, the skin series as well, suddenly, how that goes when you have hindsight and you look back and you realize, my God, this work really was uh, a part of the uh, work that will be coming up, uh, which I, it's all about poverty. Anyway, um, so I was trying to uh, imitate a, a skin and that's why these are stitched into the frame. But uh, it was about this protective layer and the skin's ability to recover and, and hide and protect our inner body. Uh, most of the time we can't see beneath the surface. I began to think about all the forces that might attack the skin and its resilience to mend and survive. Diseases attack the body and are visible through the biological marks. Um, I used a lot of different objects to create these. Um, and it was strange because they, these skin series developed into these topographical sort of landscapes. And then that series morphed into what I call the baggage work, which I'll show you in a bit. And then eventually into my current work, which is this double vessel series. And you can see by the dates that this is the, that this is the current work. And, um, I have many, many of these at this point. And, and so I, I am an artist that, that 
that works on a lot of bodies of work at once, it seems. I don't know why I do that to myself, but I do. But it seems to keep me going and, and interested. And here, um, there is the, this is um, the work that is called uh, Le Long Dre. And this is a, a long moment. This was a, a, an installation and it was the first really big installation and it comes out of that concealment work. Uh, um, and it, this was shown at the SCAD gallery um, and it really was working on this idea of how would I illuminate only a little bit at a time because you cannot really see things as they are. You only view things in tiny increments. And then I continued this body of work or this idea of illuminating portions of a piece. And so all of these installations at this point were in darkened rooms and the light bulbs go on and off at different intervals so that you can never really see something. You're always peering to look like wait for the light to come back on again. Um, and this, this uh, baggage piece referenced obviously the word in itself is kind of uh, revelatory. It's, it was about my own personal baggage with poverty. So I started thinking about that. And again, it circled back. It's this one I started thinking about poverty and I was already doing it in 2004, but it didn't surface in earnest until I, I uh, watched this Hurricane Katrina. Now this next big installation, Labyrinth, uh, also using the on off lights um, and they again only reveal a portion of the of the work and this was at the um, um, studio at 620 in um, in St. Pete that's about 20 25 inch diameter and again these bags are filled with human hair and so I've been using hair since 19. 98 is when I first started using it. And I have a lot of other projects with it. Um, but at any rate, the I should go back for a second because this, this particular one, I, uh, I had solicited secrets uh, on a website anonymously. And this is back in 2004 is when I started doing that. And that time, remember that's kind of the beginning of all that stuff on the internet and people couldn't really necessarily do things right away anonymously, but I had a webmaster set that up for me. And then uh, several friends and I recorded uh, through my friend, Lynn, the sound artist, she, she recorded our secrets and this plays continuously through the installation. And there are also video cameras hidden in the installation and they surveil people uh, on the outside, uh, th they're surveilling you on the inside, but on the outside, the, the uh, monitors are sitting there. So you can see what people are doing inside the room behind the curtain. It's uh, kind of that thing of like letting you in behind the curtain. Um, and then I, in 2006, you may recall, I said, I, I, uh, I heard Jared Diamond speak and, um, but I had also witnessed Katrina and this hung out to dry. This was the first hung out to dry piece. That was totally a reference to, um, to Katrina, but in a way it was also a, 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 a reference to uh, the environment because I, again, I was using this staining method that uses uh, materials that decay. Uh, these are made with rust and tea. And uh, there was a staining process that I developed over years. And by this time I was starting to really have control over it. Although I, I've always liked the surprise and the method came about totally by surprise, but that's the part of being aware when you're making work, like what, what will surprise you and how can you use it? Um, and then I had another uh, piece that was shown at the art lot in Brooklyn. And um, this piece is made out of silk organza and the animal on the pillow is also made out of silk organza and stuffed with hair. And this poor piece uh, was out there for six uh, months and uh, went through a hurricane, uh, multiple snowstorms, it had a six month showing and miraculously 
it survived, whereas some of the other pieces at the art lot did not survive. Uh, because those those poles go down uh, uh, onto a rebar that's sucked, sunk, sunk down about three feet. That was my husband's doing. He said, got to put these suckers down there so that those poles will stay. That was the year, people probably don't remember, that New York had, I think, like 80 mile an hour gusts of a hurricane that came through. Um, and here's another hung out, uh, um, hung out to dry piece. And um, this was shown at the Jersey City University Gallery uh, in the flesh art show. And just more of my stained items and uh, these distorted or distorted bodies in my mind that hang on these lines uh, showing all of our foibles and our, and our uh, you know, what we do to people. <laughs> and then um, this became one of the biggest until I did the last tree uh, installations uh, to date. And this was shown at the Morian Art Center. Um, and I just went ahead and titled this one hung out in the projects and it's viewed from scaffolding and it's surrounded uh, by scaffolding. But anyway, it measured about uh, 40 by 20 feet. And um, there were, again, items with hair and you can see that on the lines. And there was a, um, there's all kinds of shapes on the floor and there's my old windows. And, and in fact, we inserted even an old window into the, there was an entrance way there and we closed up the entrance and put in an old window there and there you can see the scaffolding and the idea was to to have you view it from a distance and to feel somewhat removed so that you're not walking through it because that's how we we as people like to put people over in the projects we don't want to like go in there and know about them and that's where the idea came from and Another thing that was interesting is I had a sound piece in it um, that was also uh, edited and put together for me by sound artist Lynn Culbertson. And um, it was this cacophony of uh, urban noises that emanated from a boom box in the trash can. And I got this idea of using the trash can and the boom box because Another artist friend had told me about living near the projects in um, when he was going to Rutgers and how at night some of the people would literally chain a boombox into a trash can and have it playing all night long to um, try and uh, scare away all the gentrification or whatever, whatever was going on there and they wanted to make noise and that's what they did. So they, nobody could go and turn it off and it just played played on a loop. Um, anyway, here's more objects that were in there. And, um, and then uh, also along the wall would scroll these phrases or words uh, that were like one in five children, uh, public housing, uh, insecure, it was, thoughts about what it was like to, you know, for my own personal being, what it was like also to live in the projects and some of the things that you think of and how you'll escape. Um, and many cannot escape that life. But at any rate, then uh, Luna Window was a second installation in 2013. So I had the big installation uh, that Elisa has in her little, uh, uh, her screen behind her, that was um, the last tree. And then later that fall, I had Luna Window at the AC Institute in Chelsea. And the word Luna comes from um, the word, uh, well, it comes from the place when the place is uh, Cleveland, and, and it, it was Luna Park, which was the answer to Coney Island. So these housing projects were built on what was once a amusement park. And uh, the irony of that did not escape me because here is this horrible place that you're living. And prior to that, the history of this land was an amusement park in Cleveland. So it was called Luna Park and that's where the word Luna comes from. 
Uh, a lot of people think, oh, it's the moon or, you know, it's some, <laughs> somebody that, no. Um, anyway, that, that uh, um, let me skip over here. I wanted to, so going on, I had also other, I continue to make the Luna window work. And uh, here's just a few, a couple of the others. And then I'm gonna show you a drawing because as I mentioned, and these details are to show you that these things are stuffed with hair. There's all kinds of materials I use. And this one, for example, has cheesecloth and silk organza and cotton organza and leather and uh, just a multitude of items. And then these are the drawings that I make um, for the projects. As I visualize them, I make finished drawings. I consider these finished drawings. I don't consider them just studies. Um, and I do frame them. Um, and then this body of work, which is also part of this was shown, I don't know if you caught it in the first slide, but it was sitting over there at the AC Institute show. And uh, the name a measure comes from um, uh, this idea I was uh, reading a, a column by uh, the philosopher Robert Creasy, I think it's Creasy or Creasy. And he was saying that Aristotle called the truly moral person, quote, a measure, because our encounters with such a person show us our shortcomings. And what I like to think about with this piece is that human beings, the way we treat animals is a measure of who we are. And because if you treat the animal well, you'll treat the person well, you'll treat everything on the species well. Um, and that's where the title came from. And then th that piece, oh, I should mention that that piece is cast wax with uh, um, graphite uh, rubbed in and then also cast dry pigment in parts of it as well. So it's a combination. And this piece now is the a Measure Animal with Shroud and was shown in 2020 at the Creative Pinellas Art Gallery. And again, I'm just showing the sketch because I, I, it's the only way I can conceptualize and I have to figure out how these things are gonna work. And this one is cast steel. It's a, so it's a little bit different. And, um, and then the, it's steel rings that are rusted with old nails and um, that's white silk organza. And then here's some more of the, the last tree squared uh, is, these are some more of the um, work that is involved with the environment. And this is ongoing as well as the vessel series that's ongoing. Um, and this was shown at the Museum of Fine Arts in St. Pete. And you can see here that I'm using lots of pieces and parts of everything that I have in other ones. This is again, a cast wax animal, one of the pails with a stump in it, an actual stump, silk organza, a drawing on silk organza, and then tacked to the wall is a, a graphite drawing on canvas that is coated with modeling paste and sanded. And then this piece, uh, was shown at the Morian Art Center uh, in 2018. And again, these animals are stuffed with human hair uh, and stitched in obviously a multitude of materials. And I decided this time to gather plastic I used over uh, some months and, and I don't know how long, whatever, to fit under the boat. And so I was making a comment on both the idea of plastic, as well as, uh, you know, the, just making a comment on the environment again. And you can see the boat is named the last sea. I'm going to switch now back to how I got to the, um, the hair nest work, that's the current work, which began with uh, uh, my series called Fallout, Beauty Lost and Found. Um, and this was an examination of the nature of beauty. Remember I said I started, I had also worked with uh, issues of beauty, but to me, th this piece was about the loss of beauty and its resurrection. Um, in 1998, I noticed a lot of hair loss and I decided to start collecting it. Uh, I've been collecting my hair daily 
since 1998. <laughs> um, it's quite an obsession anyway, but for years I stuffed it into jars. And then in 2005, I somehow connected my hair loss to the loss of beauty. And I was trying to figure out a way that I could recapture my beauty. So each day I decided to make a daily doodle and then make drawings of these daily doodles. And I thought if I could do this beautiful drawing, I would recapture my beauty and my hair, my hair would no longer be lost. And obviously I'm saving it, so it's not lost. It's just not on my head. And um, so surprisingly the act uh, uh, that began as a documentation of erosion and all that that implies became something else. It's like a private secret language tracking across time. And in this piece, it's an extension of that work. This was in the Feminine Mystique show at the Jersey City Museum. The actual doodles are stitched this time to the, to the piece. Um, and that's a year of hair loss. And they're all dated and marked in there. Um, and then this is another piece that's just a month of hair loss. And I decided to do these. Uh, uh, this is all using a baby picture of me that my father took. Uh, my father was a photographer, uh, not, not, not by income, but he was a photographer. And um, the hairness piece is the current body of work. And this work began, I mean, it actually began in 2014, but I did these small studies of it, which I don't have here. And you know, I did tons of those. And then I started making them, the first big one I started making in 2018. And this one, you'll see it goes from 18 to 2020. And that's because I came back and kept making changes to it. Um, and they all contain a large uh, uh, panel, which is coated with a modeling paste, uh, first many coats of gesso and then modeling paste and it's sanded to achieve this fresco-like surface. Um, and the branches are made of a variety of materials. And in this instance, it's made out of my uh, stained silk organza. And that's why I've got the details so you can have somewhat of an idea of what's happening there. And then the hair nest in this instance is made from my hair loss over the course of a year. So hence the title hair nest 16, this is the hair loss from 2016. And so I then fabricated these nests, you know, sit there, put all those hairs in there. <laughs> and um, it, it, you'll see in the, the, the subsequent ones that it comes into play in different places in the pieces. Uh, this is going to be a series of 10. And the idea for me was that I was going to um, show 10 years of hair loss, but not sequentially. So I wanted hair from one time period and then I'm gonna go and, and you'll see like, I now have pieces where the hair is from a different time period. Um, this one has an actual branch and um, these graphite drawings are, they're set up the way they are because I want the trees to look like they're disappearing, that they're not completely filled in. This has a fiberglass sphere with dry pigment on the bottom and pond fancy pond stones. And then this piece that uh, was made in 2020 has cast lead crystal, fire glass on the floor, the hair nest is there. And um, you can see the, the, uh, the, the, the lead crystal is protruding from the panel. Now, all subsequent ones might not necessarily have that, but these three do. I have the, uh, um, the, the, you know, the pieces. There was an actual branch in the previous one. This one has that. Um, uh, like this one, for example, does not have, and this is the most recently finished, does not have a branch protruding, but this has cast wax branches and um, uh, obviously the same treatment for the panel and the graphite drawing and the branches are sitting in this drawer that is filled with fire glass. Um, and then that's a termite riddled stump, uh, another piece of a tree. And that's my hair nest loss from 2000. And I put a picture of me in here so that you could get a sense of the scale of the pieces. And, uh, um, 
And then this is this is the last slide, and this is the end of my talk. And I'm and this is the what as I mentioned, I I do these studies to uh, uh, you know figure out how I'm going to fill a space. And this is going to be Fell Tree, which will be appearing at the Hillsborough Community College Gallery 221 in Tampa, opening October 10th. And the, the columns that are strung to the ceiling are going to be, um, they're silk organza and they're going to be tree rubbings uh, with graphite on silk organza. So those will be like this ethereal pieces. Then there's real stumps, and then there's real pails, and there's real little trees, all different sizes, which will be wrapped in organza. And there's two drawings that are on the left, and those will be like my drawings in the, uh, you know, the hair nest project. And then I have some smaller drawings that are off to the other side. And that's the installation and pretty much the end of my presentation. Um, um, Babs, uh, you forgot to say uh, the, the spiral will be made of, you told me about it. I said what? The, 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 the floor, you have an spiral drawing. Uh, can you tell about that? Oh yes, what's on the what's on the floor? Uh, mm -hmm. Though th you're talking about this this uh, this installation, this latest yes. piece, the, up the upcoming yeah. one. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I didn't even think to bring any pictures of my cast bricks. These are upcycled uh, bricks that uh, will lay on the floor in a spiral form, uh, and it's been interesting making them and I, I love the project. I love these bricks. <laughs> I love my bricks because what is interesting is I have cleaned out all my paper. I've gone through all my files and I'm now upcycling all the stuff that I would normally throw away. And now they've become these bricks and any junk mail. Um, so I, I love the idea that I finally have it as a as a true upcycled piece yeah. or an element of it is truly upcycled. Yeah, I want to read a few comments before we begin or continue the conversation. Thank you for the presentation, Babs. You know that I love your work and I saw it in person. So I, I, you are, your work is dear to me. So thank, thank you, you thank for, you. for the thank presentation. You, you have a comment from Wendy that it says, Babs, your beauty is within, not in your hair. This is powerful, meaningful work. You are beautiful. Oh, so, thank you. Thank you. You have another comment from Shelly that it says, certainly fascinating work. Yeah. And let me see another one. Wendy, wow, you think big? Good luck with that installation, okay? Thank you, thank I think you. That I read the comments. Uh, Babs, uh, going back in time, because I see your work and your passion, your dedication, you, I know how much you investigate, you read, you work. I mean, it's really what a true artist, you know, you really resemble like a true artist, you know, the passion and the commitment. But I want to know, how and when you realized that you were an artist? Um, it's an interesting question because my father was a photographer and I, I also, as a very young child, I was always making things. And so there's art in our family. And uh, I can remember and I, I, I had this conversation earlier with Elisa, but then this dawned on me. I was thinking about the first time I entered the dark room with him. And this is before my father got ill and we landed in the projects, but I remember entering the dark room with him and I was four or five years old and he let me in there to see the magic of a photograph appear in the tray. And I thought, my God, this is so fascinating. 
and I'm thinking this as a little kid. And I knew then that I wanted to do these kinds of things. And um, I also, there was, I have a varied past. I, it's, I think I mentioned to Elisa, I like to think of, I had exotic beginnings and then we landed in a projects in, in uh, Cleveland. And uh, the only, originally the only source of art was if the school took a field trip or whatever, because by the time I was 10, my father had already become sick with MS and it continued. But I just knew way back then that that's just what I was gonna do. Uh, well, you said the, the word, the magic. I think that that's what can open up, you know, the, the heart of any artist when we feel the magic, we, we are all different and we all feel the magic differently, but there is that moment. And thank you for answering me. I didn't know that. And I'm, I'm also curious to know how is your working process in the studio? Do you go every day? Do you have many hours? Do you, uh, how, we see all your drawings, we, not all, but many of them, we see the installation, but what is Bob's, life in in everyday studio time okay it's uh i try to get into the studio as much as possible but i think i had mentioned uh to elisa too that art is happening everywhere all the time i might have i mean i have my sketchbooks everywhere and or something will come to mind and you're rapidly putting it down on a piece of paper. And uh, I, I had also mentioned that much to my uh, chagrin, uh, to my husband, is my art invades everywhere in the damn house. And I have a big studio. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I'm currently, for example, I'm doing all the making of the bricks in the downstairs part of the studio, but every night I sit and shred at the kitchen table, I'm shredding. I'm the shredder. So when I'm making these different pieces and parts, it was the same thing when I was constructing all the pails, although I did have help. I hired people for certain things, but there's like I think there were 1500 roots sewn to those pails or something for the 193, you know, that are in there. My husband, who used to call himself the art bitch, that comes from the movie New York Stories, because he was over there drilling all the holes in the pails. And we have production things going. When you're doing a big piece, there's always production parts to it. Um, and then there's other pieces and parts. I, I um, like I said, I have multiple things going. And if I want to switch to something else, then I switch for a little while. But once I have a deadline, a date, I'm possessed or obsessed and they, all the things that have to do. And I even get to the point where I time things. I know how long does it take me to stitch one stump together and put it in the pail and stuff it. And I'm going, oh, you know, a hundred to go, only 90, I mean, hundred done, only 193 to go. And it's the same thinking with, for example, how long it takes me to cast one of my paper bricks. Um, so it's, they're, they're actually pretty cool. I should have tossed one into the, to the slideshow. Well, next time. Um, <laughs> but uh, so it's, I think an artist's, an artist that's always working, it's not really about, I mean, I think some artists say, oh, you go and you sit in there. And I do that too. You sit in there and, and, and ponder things. But I have so many pieces and parts now going, for example, I'm experimenting right now with how it's going to be to wrap the tree and whether I'm going to use, I have this beautiful cotton organza too, but then I, I you know, and I have rolls of silk organza that I've ordered that I have. And I'm thinking, well, I have enough. And though, what would this look like? And there's also an experimentation that goes on. I mean, it's how I developed the, the stain bath that I developed for all those stain paintings. I, you know, so I'm playing around. I'm always playing around. Okay. Well, Babs, before I continue, I will tell you, Basha Ruth Nelson, it says, 
She says, wonderful, your work touch, touch me deeply. And you have a message from Susan Williams. And she said, love hearing about your father and becoming an artist, ingenious developments with materials. So- Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, I, and thank you, um, Basha. Thank you. Um, I, I have two more things and then we'll open because you know the best is participation. That's my belief. But I have two more things to ask you, Babs. One is if you can define yourself as, a, as an artist with a few words, maybe I put you on the spot, but if you have like a couple of words or a few words that define you as an artist, what would it be? I think, an, I think it's a curiosity, uh, uh, research interests. Um, I think being an artist allows me to explore these uh, different uh, uh, projects that I'm interested in. And I don't mean, I, I shouldn't say projects, but making the projects allows me to explore things like climate change or what do trees add to our life? Uh, what are the, um, uh, and I'll go on different sites. And I just had come across a, a, a woman that's doing this extraordinary work and I need to get her book like uh, Diana Beers, uh, Beers, somebody probably knows this, Beers van Kroger. And um, she, she's a scientist and, uh, but, but she's been working uh, with the trees and uh, she has a Celtic background and a wisdom that comes from the forest. And, uh, and, and she talks about what the trees provide and um, learning about different organizations that are doing things. So the work allows me to delve into all these things that I have interest in. And the other word I would use is passion, passion about something, curiosity uh, that puts you in there and, and says, oh, I wanna make something addressing this. Those two are so deep and important, really. Thank you for that. And my last, uh, I'm curious to know, what do you think that the arts contribute to humanity, contributes to humanity? What, what we are doing as artists, what is our the mission that you think that you know we provide, we do, is it too much to ask you that? No, no. I think that uh, that uh, we we provide a history, we provide a vision, we provide a, a, a chronicle of what is going on. We provide. Uh, I mean, think about the artifacts. Uh, think about things that tell you what has happened in past societies. Uh, it, to me, it's just like uh, when they chop down a tree and they do tree ring dating and they can figure out when, what climate uh, that that tree lived through. And so they can figure out what the climate was like. It's like, in a way, you're sort of uh, like a scientist in a bizarre sort of way, but not really. Um, but you're also pointing out to other people what is going on. Uh, so I think... We also, I think as artists, we have a more unique way of looking at the world uh, as a creative, the same way that writers do, uh, the same way that, that cre any creative, uh, even music, you, you're, you're telling a story and you're also giving information, but you're also coming at it from a different um, perspective than someone who is a scientist buried in, a, in their specific little challenge you can uh and you can branch out and challenge yourself um it's it's a fascinating uh occupation it's a fascinating thing to be and i think humanity needs artists it's just like the entertainers we need, about it. <laughs> right it's it's culture we are a part of it i don't know if that answers that is, definitely it answers and we open doors what you are saying, we open doors for ourselves and for our human human fellows, definitely. Uh, I, I have a comment here and then I will ask, you know, uh, if anybody has questions, instead of writing on the on the chat, 
just wave or just remove your, you know, unmute yourself and we, you can ask a question to, to Babs. Let me read this before so I don't miss one of the comments. I think uh, it's interesting what Doug, Doug is saying uh, uh, yes. down at the bottom. That's very interesting. Um, About the Wendy? Yeah, Wenda Goo. Yes, uh, you can reuse his hair. And Heidi Hatchery, who, whom I know, uh, her stuff is fascinating. And um, Joseph, you know, this is interesting with Joseph Boyce and his felt. I have, uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned it, I probably forgot to mention it, but I have planned felted limbs with hair are some of the next uh, pieces that will go into one of the hair nests and I'm obviously a huge fan of Joseph Boyce and, and his work and the way he puts his pieces together. Um, and because normally, as you, you know, felt is with wool and I have already done some experimentation felting with human hair and it's very cool. <laughs> well, it says uh, Eva has and her use of resin plus earth works, conceptual art, installation art, and fiber art meeting, environmental art. Well, you have a, you know, a few names. Also, you know some of them. So I would like to know who has some questions or is curious about any of your works or about your career. Any of you? Uh, Okay, we have Wendy. Did you ask a question, or do you want to ask a question? No, oh, no. I I thought that it. Okay. There are, there are no. some more. If you want, oh, there's somebody putting their hand up. Sandra. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Sandra. How are you? Okay, you. So nice to see you here. Yes. You. Wonderful. Very nice to see you. So what do you want to ask Babs? I want to ask, uh, because we don't just drop out of the sky, naturally, we have a history. And I want to, uh, I was wondering, because I made the connection to Eva Hess's work right away. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I wonder if uh, she, in her aesthetic of have influenced you because it looks to me like it has uh very much so i mean i have earlier works i have so much work i have earlier works that were really when you looked at them you would think eva hess i mean i i was influenced uh, as many were by her but i have other artists that uh, um were fascinating interesting to me as well, um, you know, Peter Coyne with her use of hair, but I, I remember the first time I walked into her installation of the wax chandeliers at Jack Shaman on, when it was on Broadway way back. And then her, her pieces that hung with the sculpture center with all this, they were organic or biomorphic. And there is a definite tie to people that, that do that work, but she had these mud these big mud uh, sculpture pieces that hung from the, the ceiling too, and they grew up from the floor. Right. Um, but uh, there, and, and, and of course, the, the, for me, like the big panty on the hung out to dry was very much like a Louise, Bo Louise Bourgeois. And I mean, I could see that. So there's this, all of this influence of these past uh, women artists that were definitely uh, ruminating around in there. And um, one of the things I'll mention, this is not about Eva Hess necessarily, but when I do these little drawings, what's fascinating to me is that they, they come out having this surrealistic feel, but the biomorphic shapes, but there's, my work has nothing to do with surrealism. Oh, and I think of some of the work of, um, uh, of Eva Hess that felt that way, these distorted, weird objects. But, uh, and then I think of uh, Kiki Smith with her uh, many, many different types of work. And I remember she had this incredible 
show uh, down uh, when it was, um, it was not Jeffrey Deitch, she took over that space. And I'm trying to remember who was it down in Soho. And she had the person leaning over with this long entrail coming out. And I don't talk a lot about the entrail stuff because, but that's in my baggage work. And that's also a part of those, these earlier pieces and those kind of same shapes, they're definitely there. Thank you, great. So we have another question from Regina. Yes, uh, hi, thank you hi. so much. So much ATOA and Babs. Uh, I was very moved by your uh, work. It's um, so politically astute. Uh, Mother Nature is smiling on you. Um, my question is, um, uh, you're using hair, you're using other things. Is there a smell when people go into the gallery? And would you even consider maybe a smell of safe molds or you know, seaweed or, you know, because, well, well, that's my question. Well, it's interesting because I, I collect the hair from, I mean, I've had so many different salons that have collected hair for me. I mean, I have a whole other, this other body of work that I did these little box portraits. I call them box portraits, but they don't, they don't look like anybody in particular, but I had names for them because they look like those people to me. And they were made from this hair. And when you first get the hair, it's fascinating to open up the bag and the, the different chemicals, the different uh, shampoos and the all of the things that happen in a salon actually are in there. <laughs> but somehow over time, they lose the smell. And that was fascinating to me too. Like, why is that? Is it something that's like a perfume that fades or, um, but I have used, I have used everything else I think at this point between <laughs> video and every weird material I can think of, but I have not focused on smell, although it's there. And I will tell you, even with the wood, like I'm working on these for that, this installation now, and I have pretty much think I have all the stumps, the tree stumps, and I now have to cut them so that they're flat and you're cutting them. And that smell of fresh wood, the smell of wood that permeates. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see how long it holds on to that uh, in the gallery. Um, but I don't specifically think I'm gonna make something that smells a particular way. Oh, okay, well, I think that we have Doug that is mm -hmm. racing. Um, yes. So this kind of work, uh, and I'm certainly not equating it to other people, but this nature of work, which is rather minimal, you know, to say in, in terms of the installations, although I see some of your installations are what I would call non-minimal, there's something else. Uh, they're installations, but they're, they're not minimal. But the yeah. one that you, the one that's behind you is by its nature, very minimal, repetitive, et cetera. Um, that work, and in fact, all installation work, the challenge, I think, is storage. Uh, so, so it must be that, and I see this throughout the art world, it must be that in order to um, uh, create a legacy of the work, yeah. you have to be really uh, documenting everything, you and your, the collectors, the museums, um, the gallerists, et cetera. You have, to, you have to be doing that in order to show it in some areas uh, where it cannot be in a gallery space in order to publicize it, of course, in order to, uh, but in order to maintain it uh, as a legacy, in order to have it for perpetuity, this kind yeah. of work, not just yours, but this, this whole genre of work requires the documentation. Do you do this strictly photographically or do you also do videos where you may walk around and talk about the work or what do you do uh, for that purpose? I do have some videos. Uh, 
I had it, originally I had a friend who had a great camera and he did a video for me of the, for example, the hung out in the projects. I wanted to make sure that I had some video of it. And then of course, with the onset of having your little video in your hand, um, I've started to, to do that. It's obviously not great documentation, but it's still there and you can see it. And um, so I try to do that and I do this all myself. Um, all this work is basically self-funded. Yeah. <laughs> I figure out ways. I'm in, in fact, I'm on deadline to apply for a grant tomorrow uh, that I want to get some funds for this work. Um, I do sell the drawings. I sell the um, all of the double vessel. In fact, I have gallery representation and they're they they've been selling some for me so that's good um i have a gallery in atlanta and i have a gallery in jacksonville florida and thankfully they've sold some work <laughs> but that is hither and thither still and um and the storage has become an issue uh and I, in fact it's it's uh, interesting because i'm full up i considered some storage when i had my studio here built uh, but it's really not enough. And um, and uh, my husband's always saying, what about those days when you were just a painter? You know, I have my MFA in painting. The good old days. <laughs> good old days. Wow. And, and it is an issue. I mean, it's, it's, I have right now, I have stored in part of my studio, these stumps all go on racks. I had racks for them and then they're, you know, they're cardboarded up. So they're on, they're on shelves. Mm -hmm. um, and you may mention this thing about minimal. I just want to address that for a second. This work was meant to look a little bit like headstones, like a graveyard. And I thought about having them more like when you come to a place that's the, the trees have all been felled mm -hmm. and you're seeing this open deforested area and there's there's no there's no squared up road up it's they're all over the place but i wanted this idea of of thinking about walking into a graveyard um as headstones and uh i gotta say the other thing that i just want to make a comment about which has nothing to do with your question when i made this piece back in 2013 thinking about the countries represented by the un uh has really made me think a lot these days about what's going on with the un and obviously the war in ukraine um and it's it's weird to look back on a work and think about a work and the research i did at the time and why i wanted it to represent every country on earth type of thing or acceptable or a part of the un and and what that meant and obviously the the hair is from how, who knows how many people. I mean, this hair, I had salons collecting hair for me starting back in 1996 when I was first working with hair or 95. So that they, and I store the hair too. So I have storage problems with bins of hair. I mean, sculptors inherently have a problem. And one of the things I have not thought about is what am I going to do with this installation once it's done? <laughs> Right. I only uh, think about making them. <laughs> on, on that storage issue, though, I just saw a program. We saw, we saw, we, my wife and I saw this program. I'm thinking in the last 48 hours at some point about storage. So there are some new facilities. They're all in Europe at the moment uh, that are massive. There's one in uh, not Amsterdam, but in uh, whatever this, the, the big port city of, of uh, the Netherlands is that is just it's the most massive structure built exclusively for storage but allows right. but allows people to go in and look at works of art yeah. including including minimalist works all sorts of works yeah uh, um, somewhat in context uh and and that seems to be a new trend now is to try to create much more storage facilities and yeah. to much more with much more storage and to make them publicly accessible, which I think is very interesting. Because museums, museums are notorious for only having something like five percent of the work that they own on view. 
sometimes yeah. well. Well, it's one yeah. of the where I worked in museums, and that's one of the situations that they face all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the storage and also the, the conditions of the storage. Right. Because you can have the space, but you need climate control and many other things. So right. Right. it's a very interesting question, Doug. Yeah. And it is a it's a problem for, for sculptors. I mean, it is one of the bigger problems. It's a lot easier to, to store a lot of paintings. Um, but what do I do with these projects? And if you saw how they break down, that's one of the things I do think about, by the way, shipping the breakdown, like like those branches that are stuck on the panel, they pop off. They're uh, on a keyhole fastener, which uh -huh. I had, uh, you know, for the uh, the cast glass, it's routed out in the back and there's a situation and you just literally clamp it right down. Uh -huh. uh, and but then I have all the pieces and parts for each one and they do. I have to have diagrams that are really laid out. Um, it does take a lot of planning, even the pieces that are hung on the lines, they're all labeled, numbered, uh, and they're all they everything comes down <laughs> and condenses. But then if somebody goes to put it together, they like some of them I have pretty good roadmaps. Some of them they need me and I gotta like work on that part of it. So that's well, another part I, when you are I would kind say, of artist. You should think Warhol here, you know. I, I uh, yes. You could take <laughs> you could take those those pails that are behind you after you've fully documented the work uh, and market each pail as a you know element of the artwork. And people could own and display one pail with, with the net or whatever the fabric, I guess, and the hair hair inside. I got to tell you, Doug. I can't tell you how many people asked me if the pails were for sale individually. Uh -huh. People wanted those pulled, pails, but you them. I'm <laughs> I'm so past that now. I'm beyond the pail. Well, uh, I want to say, Babs, don't worry so much. Totally so much. I I agree with the idea to mark and number and document is very important. And I know the space and the storage. But you know, Anthony Gaudí, that is a genius, was a genius architect from Barcelona. He didn't document so well how to finish La Sagrada Familia. And it mm -hmm. took years and years to for groups of architects to find out how to continue. So, you know, you have in the, now is the process to enjoy the creativity and then, you know, just to mark it. Well, yes, worry about it later. Yep, <laughs> yep, I agree. And if you have enough documentations, people will recreate it if they want to recreate it. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I, I would like to travel this. In fact, I, I keep working on that. I mean, that's the idea for me too, to keep it traveling. Get some place to show this again. Uh, That's um, a great idea. Mm -hmm. So we have mm -hmm. a few more minutes. I don't know if we have anybody, uh, you know, also wanting to ask a question or a comment. We are open now, you know, for. A couple of people made some comments here. Susan Darwin, thank you for your comment. All the stitching and ripping, so much work, love it. Um, what do you think of as you work? Is it therapeutic? Well, like, uh, is there is there a flow? Do you do you like the drawing? I can imagine what you're thinking about, but then when you're stitching all of these things repetitively, yeah. are you you know? Do you get into a flow or what's yeah. your mental state like? <laughs> you know, so it's it, it it is, and there's this. Uh, you do get into that state, and I. I think like a lot of artists that do repetitive work, there is there is a meditative quality to it. There is uh, that you, I've always enjoyed making things. So each one, even though you're, it's not totally repetitive, even though the stitching of putting this on, you're still, as I'm sitting there creating the final stump, for example, and you're putting on the little roots 
like even the one where I have the Luna window ladders and they're coming out of the thing and you're you're arranging and you're making and you're thinking and it's up and you keep stepping back and then where do you need more? So it's a constant uh, process. The drawing can be meditative as well. And you're like anybody, you, you constantly are stepping back, you look at it, you do a little area, you come back in mean, hours and hours and hours. I mean, I can't even tell you how many hours it took to make each of the installations and the pieces there this it's time consuming and the objects now that are sitting in front of the drawings the hairness drawings i must have changed the objects in the last one i can't tell you how many times so you while you're thinking about that you work on the drawing for a while and go okay now let me see what happens if i put an object here or i put this down here and um I just fell in love with those weathered sheets of plywood that are on the floor at the bottom of that piece that the termite riddle stump. That termite riddle stump sat in my yard, I don't know how for how many years, and got worse and worse and worse. And then I finally sprayed it, then I bagged it, and you bag it and you leave it in the sun, and that will totally kill them. Because everybody asks me, they come in and they go, oh, oh, well, that. Are those, are those really dead there? Like, do I have to worry about this piece in the museum? Like, <laughs> a couple of curators were having that discussion. Said, yeah, it's, they're pretty well dead. There's nothing going on there. That's, I finally grabbed the stump at that time. And this is off your subject, but what's fascinating is when you go to pick up that stump, it's light. Yeah. It's light because it's all filled with all these termite trails. I've got another one that's going to yeah. be in another piece that's sitting bagged, but yes, I, I guess that answers your question. It's 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 a combination, and there's periods of it where you're just. Um, it's got to be. Uh, was it Liza Lou's uh, beads? You know, sitting there beading an entire kitchen. I mean, I remember when I walked into that installation, I was just blown away. I don't know if people remember, but she showed it at the new museum. I think it was the first showing of that thing. And I just went, oh my God, I thought I was obsessive. <laughs> <laughs> well, for sure, you are not the only one. Yeah. But you have, you have a good collaboration with nature. That's, uh, you have a, a, a big group of collaborators when you leave the, the wood outside. So. It's yes. good to be, to be working in, in sync with nature. Yes, That's yes, a good thing. yes. So and, uh, it is interesting because the first stain pieces happened when I was living in Tybee Island, our first split time between New York and, um, and the South was Tybee Island, Georgia, outside of Savannah. And we had this incredible lot and behind the house, we are we're on a marsh. And I literally just took the frames outside and dumped them on the, let them sit in the marsh. And I mean, they cooked quick. And I have now ones that are sitting out there for the next, because uh, those are rusted steel frames that I use on those, uh, the vessel pieces, the stain paintings. And the, I, I cook them for a long time, as I call it. It's the same thing when I'm staining, I cook it for, a period of time to get the marks that I get. Okay. Well, uh, I don't know, uh, Doug, if we. Yes, I'm. I'm going to jump in here and use this moment to uh, give a big thank you to our presenters, Alyssa Pritzker and Babs Reingold. Thank you. Uh, and to our Zoom and YouTube team of Maruna Stratton and Natalia Dragnea as well as other volunteers, including our programming coordinator, Kristen Eichenberg, and interns, Emily Villarreal, Catherine Carrillo, and Abby Herman, and our programming committee and board of directors. And thank you all, those of you who came tonight or see us on YouTube. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.